Uh, I want to just make an announcement. Last week, we gave you these flyers about our Freedom Retreat. And if any way we can convince you to take step two after this and, and, and take off a Friday and a Saturday, you will be renewed and changed. Um, every one of us on staff, as we were deciding if we were going to do this retreat, uh, went to Texas and participated in it. And all of us, as much as we knew God, um, there was a life breathed back into us. Uh, places people were stuck were broken. So it's a tremendous thing. And we're trying to make it as easy as possible for you guys. So you can actually sign up in the back with Cindy Richard on our break, before and after. Uh, you can sign up online if you want, but we're here to make it easier for you. And always to think of bring someone with you. You've got an adult kid that's stuck, pay him to come. I used to pay my kids to read books. I remember paying my middle son $100 to read a book because it was so worth it if he could get the concept into him. And he'd read anything for $100, right? This was, so um, it was like, I thought, how much counseling am I gonna pay for him if he doesn't get this idea? So I started paying my kids, it was so good. Started with a nickel a page and then it went up to $100, but it was worth it. So I often will take someone just say, I, not only am I gonna pay for this for you, but once you come and I'll pay you this amount of money, and they look at me like, you will? Isn't that bribery? Absolutely. <laughs> but the things that will happen in this are worth their while for the rest of their lives. So um, let's open in prayer. Lord, you are present. You said, I am in all places at all times. I behold the good and the evil, and I'm a good shepherd. You said, if you seek me, you will find me. And we are here in this place this morning because we believe that you are not a man that you should lie. That's what you said. I am the Lord God. I am a rock. Is there anything too hard for me? And I am not a man that I should lie. Lord, people have lied to us, and we've protected ourselves, but we're here today to say, if you tell the truth, then I will follow you. So we submit to you where we've believed lies today. Show us. Help us see so that we can exchange the lie for the truth you want to give, that we might walk in this freedom that you've promised. You said... Three things will abide, faith and hope and love. And Lord, we're asking you, fill us with this faith and this hope and this love this day so that we might understand and know you and go forward with great joy. We invite you into this place. Amen. Amen. So good to see you guys. So just a real brief review. We started with Neil, who talked about definitions of freedom and who said that freedom's the ability to respond fully out of what God made you to be. You don't have to protect yourself and guard yourself. And that freedom was the presence of someone, not the absence of something. As his presence came in, those other things would begin to drop off. Then I taught for Kevin on levels of change, and we talked about um, when we begin to believe what God says about himself, and about who he says we are, that our identity affects all the different levels of our life. It affects our beliefs, our capabilities, where we limited ourselves. It affects our behavior. And then our environment begins to change without us having to focus on it. Jenny came in, just did an outstanding job of showing that the kingdom of God was present everywhere we were. It was present and active on earth and that God wanted to partner with us. And that we disconnected in the beginning from life. And that he came to reconnect us to life. And he, she ended with a story about a radio station that um, it resides outside, but it's being broadcast all over the place. And 
There are radio waves all around us, even in this room, but you can't hear what's being played until you tune in. You have to get to the right frequency. And that um, as soon as we tune in, that we can begin to hear in a way that we haven't heard before. And that a lot of us have heard about the kingdom of God, but we're not tuned in. And so we're not hearing. And that brings us to a place today where I'm going to talk to you about hearing God. And um, if God speaks, then we've got to learn to recognize his voice. We've got to learn to discern and hear. So what does that have to do with our freedom? Well, if God speaks, then it produces faith. And it's, God says that when we hear, we begin to believe. So he says, faith comes by hearing the word of God. And he says in his scriptures, like, seek me and you will find me. He made a promise and he said, I'm not a man that I should lie. It doesn't matter who else lied to you. I, the Lord, do not lie. If you seek me, you will find me. He said that my, I'm a good shepherd. My sheep hear my voice. And they go in and out and find pasture. Saying he leads you to the place where he fills you. So just like a blind man, all of a sudden he can't see. But what, something happens to his ears. His ears are opened. And he begins to hear in a new way. Everything, nothing changed. All around him were the waves that caused him to hear, but he didn't hear before through his ears because he perceived through his eyes. So it's the same way. The kingdom of God is here. The Lord wants you to learn to walk by faith and to hear him. And all of us who are here teaching have walked through these processes in our lives. I, I came to the Lord when I was 14. That was 44 years ago. And you learn a process like a child. You begin to learn. You, I crossed my fingers so many times thinking, reading the word and thinking, I hope it's true. I hope it's true. I'm going to try it. We'll see. And then after a while, I quit crossing my fingers because it kept happening. The things he said kept happening. So um, Bob Hamp, the one who started all the Freedom Ministries, said something. He, he was a counselor, and in the very beginning of this process, he and a group of men had come together, and, and they were reading the scriptures, and, and they read the scripture, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds forth from the mouth of God. And they were talking about hearing God, and they said, well, let's give it a try. Why don't we just come together, and, and rather than telling God what he should do or what we need him to do, why don't we just sit and listen? So they came together in the office, and they all sat, and, and they just began to pray quietly, each one of them. And every once in a while, they'd stop and look at each other, and they kept praying, and God wasn't saying anything at all. And they were getting a little discouraged, and then finally, this one man said, you know, it's really funny, I keep getting this picture of this little girl with dark hair and a pigtail um, with her father in the restaurant, and they, he said the name of the restaurant down the street. So they're all sitting there thinking, okay, so what do we do? So they decided, well, then if God is speaking, why don't we just go to the restaurant and see what happens? So they're all nervous, piled in the car, went down to the restaurant. And when they got there, there was no one matching that uh, description. And they thought, okay, uh, we missed it, or who knows what to do. So they thought, well, let's just order food and go sit over here. So the, 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 all the group had ordered food, and Bob was standing at the counter ordering his food when he got a tap on the shoulder, and he turned around, and there was the man from the vision. The exact description. It was somebody from church, and he recognized him from the description that the person said, but he knew him from church. And he turned around and, and said, Oh, oh my goodness, why are you here? And the guy said, well, to eat food. And he felt ra rather awkward. And he said, they started just talking while they're ordering. And Bob said, how's your daughter doing? Well, it turned out that the daughter was in prison. And the man said that it was really a, a very difficult and hard time for the family. And Bob said, well, you're actually the reason I'm here tonight. In fact, that whole group over there. And the man kind of stepped back like, what? You know, that's really weird. And Bob said, no, really, go ask them. You go ask them over there. I won't even go. Ask them why they're here. So the man went over, and they, and they proceeded to tell him they'd been praying, and they had this picture. And, and as they talked, and they prayed, and they counseled with that man, they really encouraged him. He's really worried, but he didn't know what to do. What am I supposed to do? My daughter's making really bad choices. It's out of my control. So they really encouraged him to seek first the kingdom of God. 
and then let God, don't worry so much about a solution, just seek the Lord. So they prayed with him and uh, he left. And about a week later, well, first of all, they were really pretty excited. Um, his, his friend said, we have got to live this way. Like, this is kind of fun. And they were full of faith because God was up to something and he was including them in what he was doing. They were, they were um, just filled with faith. Well, the next week, the daughter called Bob and said to him, she just had to tell him, his, her dad had told her about this encounter in the restaurant. She said, the night that you were sitting with my dad in that restaurant, a woman came into my prison to talk to me about the Lord, and I gave my life to Jesus Christ. So she, it was just amazing. So the, the plan of the Lord is that we walk in his footsteps. He told us everywhere you go, wherever your feet trod, you can proclaim that the kingdom of God has come because the king is within you. So he made us in his image to be his representatives. And do we have the slides up? Represent in your notes. I'm sorry, I should have told you page 27, I think, 26 and 27. 27 and 28. <clears throat> represent means to represent. So our job as we come to know the Lord is to represent God to the planet. So we live out what we believe about God. He comes into us. His power is nature. It works inside of us first. It changes us. And then pretty soon we are so full that you're overflowing. Like you fill a cup, an empty cup, You've got to fill it before it overflows. And it's God's intention to fill you, and then you overflow to the people around you. You simply can't keep it inside because you're too full. So we live not by bread alone. The Lord says, pray for your daily bread. You have daily bread. But we don't live by that. It's never going to be enough. But every word that proceeds forth from his mouth. You can wake up and eat your oatmeal, it's not enough. You sit there with the word of God and something begins to come alive. So I want to make a couple of points. Number one, faith comes not by trying really hard, but by hearing the voice of God. So we just tune in to the voice of the Lord with the purpose to follow through on the things that he wants us to do. So let's show the circle here real quick. There's a circle there. It's called living from the inside out. So at the very center of you is your spirit. It determines your identity. God made you. He decided you were going to live on earth. So you either can live from the outside in or you can live from the inside out. So you have a spirit. You have a soul. Your soul is your personality. You have a mind, a will, and emotions. Now. Your mind, you can be a thinker, you can have um, a lot of uh, rational understanding, and you can live by your rationality. If I understand it, and then I will walk in it, if I can't understand it, or you can, by force of will, move people around you uh, to your will and to your own understanding. You can live by your mind. You can live by your emotions. Um, this is a weakness in general with women. Because I feel bad, so I act bad. I feel depressed, and so it presses in on my spirit, I, and, and, it, and it rules even my body, my emotions. Or I can have a will. I'm just going to have my way, and I know how to get it. You can live by your will if you have a, we all have a body. Some people, their um, bondage is in their body. They spend hours and hours and hours in gyms, working out, building it, making their body look good. And everything is pressed in by that action. Um, their mind, their will, and their emotions, they're always thinking about, I need to go to the gym, I need to work out. Or you can have a sexual addiction. Um, so your body begins to rule your soul and your spirit. You know what you should do, but you can't do it because you're ruled by your desire for these sexual things. We know people who have, we call them sex addicts. And so God determined that we were to live from the inside out, that when his spirit filled us, that it would go out to our soul. And even though I had a rational mind or a, or a strong will, that the spirit of God would rule that will, that I would think, I know what I want, but it's not good and kind, and I'm going to 
I'm going to allow my will to be under subjection to the Spirit of God. Or emotions. I feel afraid, but I'm going to bring my emotions to the will of God, and I'm going to live through my spirit. I feel afraid, but God is with me, therefore I don't have to be. Or as we live by the Spirit, my body has desires and wants, but I can walk in self-control because I'm ruled by the Spirit. So it was always God's determination that we live according to the Spirit. That's where life comes in. That's what we're going to do at the Freedom Conference and on our very last class. We're going to look at some things that are pushing in from the outside into our spirit, and we're going to acknowledge them, take responsibility for them, and we're going to break their hold over our life. We're going to kind of give you a preview of the Freedom Conference on the very last day um, of our class where Jim Dealing teaches about breaking strongholds. But God, the freedom comes when we begin to look at his word and live from the inside out. I feel angry, but I'm not going to blow up because the spirit of the Lord is working inside of me. So the scriptures, when I went and gave my life to Christ, it said I no longer live, but the life of Christ lives in me and the life I now live in the flesh, I live in the faith of the Son of God. I got moved from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light, and I got sealed as a citizen of the king, a daughter of the king. Whole new um, future opens up before you because you begin to understand who I am and the noble cause that the Lord gives. So as you're filled up and you start to overflow, you begin to say things like, I wonder what God wants to do today. So I had made a practice as I grew in the Lord. Uh, whenever I was out shopping or buying things or just the daily stuff, Whenever I walked into a store, I would say, I don't know what you need, but I'm your ambassador. So if there's anything you need in there, anyone you need me to talk to, anything you need to do, I'm your servant. Most of the time, nothing would happen. Cindy, can I get a water? Nothing would happen. And, and uh, anyway, this one time I went into the Verizon store when it was right over here by in and out when it was right over there. <laughs> Things change, okay? And there were just a ton of people in the Verizon store, and uh, you would go in and you'd put your number in, and you'd just go sit and wait. Thank you. And there were a, um, my phone was broken, so I couldn't um, play with it. So I'm just standing there listening to the conversations around me, and there's these two Verizon representatives sitting with this one guy who looked to be about his mid-30s, and um, he was telling them he inadvertently pushed a button on his phone and it, it took him up to the next level, charged him 50 bucks a month, and he didn't realize it till his bill came and he wanted them to fix it. So they told him he, he, they could fix it for the future, but he still had to pay the 50 bucks for that month. And he was real polite and really, he goes, but, but do you understand, I didn't even use the data. Like you can see, I didn't even use it up. And, they were saying, well, we're really, really sorry about that. And I'm thinking, really, Verizon? You know, wouldn't this be a really good PR moment where you just got rid of their debt and he went and told everyone, you gotta use Verizon, but they were not going there. And, you know, in my flesh, I'm thinking, why are there two reps for this one guy and there's 40 of us all waiting for, so I'm not really walking in the spirit here, I'm just kind of complaining. <clears throat> so, but as I'm listening, it was $50. This was an extra $50. And, so all of a sudden I hear this foreign voice that says, you have $50. And I'm sitting there thinking, I have $50? Like nobody carries cash anymore. I have $50 and I open my purse, sure enough, I have $50. Now, all of a sudden I hear another voice. You know, Verizon knows a lot more about phones than you do. He probably did this on purpose and you shouldn't give your hard earned money to this guy. So I'm discerning the voices, I'm thinking, all right, let's just go give this guy. It's not my money anyway. It belongs to the king. Everything I have belongs to him. So hurry up and give this guy money before you talk yourself out of it. So I'm thinking, how do you do that, right? But I just walked up and I said, excuse me. And I wasn't listening really clearly, so I wanted to make sure. I mean, I said, would $50 fix this problem for you? And he looks at me and goes, I'm sorry, are you in line and I'm taking too much time? I said, no, no, not at all. I just happened to overhear and... Um, I was wondering if I heard correctly. And he goes, yes, it would fix it. So I said, well, I have $50. And I laid it down, and both reps go like this. 
Like they had no paradigm for what happens when somebody, the kingdom of God invades their, and they're just standing there like this. And, and I, I thought, that's kind of funny. Don't people help people? Like, why is this so foreign? And the guy goes, no, 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 I can't take your money. I can't take your money. I said, well, you can. <laughs> you actually can. And then he said, and I said, God has been really good to me. And he just told me he wanted me to be really good to you. And the guy says, well, well can, I, can I pay you back? Can I get your name and number? I said, no, just know that God watches out for you. And then I thought, well, now what are you going to do? So I walked out of the store. <laughs> because it was really kind of embarrassing. You know, like if I stayed around, it would be embarrassing for him. So I left. But this joy came over me. And I just figured I'll come back. I'll have my phone. I won't have my phone for the day. And I'll come back tomorrow. And as I left, I was thinking, well, like, what does this mean? It felt really exciting to be a part of what God wanted. I didn't know I had that money. How do you know it was a voice of God? You say, is it audible? Well, it's a foreign thought. It's a foreign thought that always makes me more noble, kind, generous than I ever intended to be in the moment. Pretty sure it's the voice of God. So my part was to give what I had. It was God's part to interpret it for him. That wasn't my job. I didn't necessarily have to say anything, but I wanted him to know it was God who said, give you this money. So maybe he was backslidden, angry at God for some reason, and God was just saying, hey, I'm still here, and I still care. I don't know. Maybe uh, it was the first encounter he had ever had. Maybe he walked away going, God, that was weird. God is there? Maybe he walked away going, I need to get back into church. I don't know. That wasn't my job to lead him to salvation. My job was just to give him the 50 bucks that I got from God because the scriptures say a man can receive nothing except to be given him from heaven. If I have the power to make wealth, then it's from the Lord. So it was so exciting. I can't remember who's given me money in the last year, but I always remember. You know, it says more, it's more blessed to give than to receive. I always remember there partnering with God in that. That was an exciting time. So um, faith comes by hearing the voice of God. And when you hear, you obey. Number two, God wants to talk to you about who you are. So um, we come to God. He kind of sneaks on us, sneaks up on us and kind of captures our heart. But he uses stuff on the planet to capture our attention. Things happen in your environment, in your jobs, your families, your circumstances, and the environment gets difficult, and then we come and talk to God, but not usually before. If everything's going smooth, we don't, unless you're mature in the Lord, tend to talk to God, right? So we come to him when things are hard and we don't know what to do. So, um, but based on the level, okay, so we usually ask at that moment, like, where do we go and what do we do? But based on the level of change, that's the lowest level of transformation. Because he's more interested in you believing the truth about who he is and who you are as one he created in his image. So he uses your environment, like where do I go, what do I do, as bait on a hook to come and talk to him. He wants to instruct you. So he's using things on earth to teach us truths about him and about us. And when we believe those things, everything changes. And he's always substituting the truth for lies. We bring in the lies, and he says, I've got a truth to tell you, and we drop those off. So number three, so God often wants to talk to you about you, and he'll use your circumstances. You say, where do I go? And he says, well, let's talk about why you're here. Why did you get here? And then all of a sudden, as he's speaking, things shift. Number three, the hearing God's voice is the primary way we disconnect from our um, knowledge, from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Remember, Jenny talked about Adam and Eve were connected to the source, and then they left it to do things on their own, to say, I really got it. I can do it my own way. Well, we have to reconnect to get life. So hearing God's voice is a primary way we reconnect. Um, revelation changes what I believe. Like, remember the video um, when we saw the wood, the, um, wood cutter, not the, the uh, 
thank you. Punchinello went up to the wood maker and he began to ask questions. And so we begin to live differently when we change our beliefs. And we gain confidence in God so that we can kind of let go of that tight grasp we have on ourselves. Like we become self-protective. I can't let anybody in. I can't change anything. I have to control everything around me because that's the only way I'm safe. But when the king comes in, we can begin to let go of that. So hearing the voice of God is um, central to living out your created design. He designed you to do something. He put you on earth for a purpose. So I want to talk about ways we hear God and how to discern that it's God we're hearing. So under your outline, ways God reveals himself. Number one, God gave scripture as the primary revelation for who he is and who we are. I want you to circle primary. Primary means way more than any other way. He gave us his scripture. He was the God who told Abraham and Moses and everyone, write down what I say. Now, if you don't have confidence in the scripture, that's a whole nother study, and you, know, you need to go take a class on that because you need to be, know and be sure that what we have is the word of God. So we open the Bible, and God begins to reveal himself, his character through his word. So that he's a father, that he's a shepherd, that he is above all, that he guards and protects. I don't have to protect myself from other people the way I used to because I know God guards and protects. In 2 Timothy 3, it says, you have known the sacred writings which are able to give you wisdom that leads to salvation through the faith which is in Jesus. And all the scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for proof, for correction, for training in righteousness so that the man or woman of God may be adequately equipped for every good work. Jeremiah says, call me. I will answer you, and I will show you great and mighty things that you have not seen before. He's saying, ask me. I will talk to you. 2 Corinthians says, I will be a father. You will be my sons and daughters. So the word of God is like a plumb line to us. So let's have that next picture. <clears throat> Oh, I don't know why that's there. Take that. <laughs> it's a really funny picture. I don't know why it's there. I should have one that's a plumb line. <laughs> no, I don't have the plumb line. Sorry. Okay, so a plumb line, if you're a, a construction worker, is a heavy line that they use in construction. There's a heavy weight at the end of a line to make sure that a wall is vertical. So if you have a foundation, then the walls you need to build upon the foundation have to be vertical. You can't eyeball it. Because if you eyeball it, it looks pretty good to me, well, each step you take goes a little bit and a little bit more off, and pretty soon you have a wall that will not hold the roof or any other heavy weight that you put upon it. So it's a starting point to make sure that things don't go way off. So we have to check the impressions that we get against the Word of God. Like when God said, you got 50 bucks. Well, there's nothing in the Word I knew that the act of compassion and goodness was from the Lord. They're always going to violate any scripture by giving this man money. So we get impressions all the time. And um, God's always reminding me of his word. So you, as you read the word of God, are building a reservoir. If I get up in the morning and I read the scriptures, God might not say anything to me. I might not hear anything, but I'm building a reservoir. Because at some time, God is going to come in and be able to pull that word out, like the time my poor husband was off at work, working really hard for me, and I was at home building a case against him. All the women laugh, right? So I was looking out my kitchen window while I was doing the dishes, and there was a particular door. We had a Dutch door. Those are the doors that are cut in half, and you can open the top or the bottom. Um, and the only thing that kept that door from opening was this little tiny latch that was broken. So anyone could just hit that door and it would open. And our neighbors had just been robbed at night. They slept through the whole thing, but someone came in and had robbed them. And the backyard went out into the middle of uh, Lemon Grove. 
So I felt unsafe, and I had talked to Mark about that door, and he had been really, really busy, couldn't fix a door. And now, um, I was standing there building this case, and the door's not fixed, and this thing isn't fixed, and we have to talk, and there's another thing that he doesn't do. And I was just really on this train roll in my mind, and I, I heard this spiritual warfare. I thought, I'm so sick of that word. I am just so sick of it. Everything is spiritual warfare, and we have some things that we need to talk about. Submissive, gentle, and kind, I had to grow in those areas as a wife. And I'm just saying, we have to talk about this. And as I'm on this train roll, I hear another word. Think on what is good and right and just and true and lovely and of good report. Let your mind dwell on these things. So there's the reservoir of the word of God coming up, and I'm thinking, shoot. Now I have a choice. <laughs> I can obey or not. You do not have, he will not make you obey, but I wanted to be a good woman. And I stood there going, ah, uh, fine, okay. I'll think on what is good. And I couldn't think of one good thing about Mark Hoffman. <laughs> so it's like the enemy overplayed his hand and I'm sitting there thinking, wait a second. Like I really, it's like 30 seconds is a long time to have no thought. <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> And all of a sudden, I thought, maybe this is spiritual warfare. So I fought from this train ride to back up. And I said, this is a good man. This is a great man. He's a good father. He's an excellent father. He's an excellent husband. And all of a sudden, this I'm able to start going. I'm thinking of all these good things. And something happened. I felt something heavy and dark lift right off my shoulders. And all the anger was gone. And I was so shocked, I went and sat down. And I thought, what just happened? What just happened? Something heavy and dark lifted off of me. And I, re and I was not angry, an absolute peace. And as I sat there, I thought, this really was spiritual warfare. Something was speaking to me that seemed natural and absolutely clear and reasonable. And the minute I began to do what God said, like it says, resist the enemy, and he must flee. That was the first time that really became clear to me. There was an enemy, and he was hidden. And when I obeyed God, he was unmasked. And he left. He had to leave. And I sat there. My loving thoughts toward Mark were so full. And that night when Mark came home, we had no incident. We had no confrontation. He came in. I was grateful, thankful. Almost had forgotten about the whole thing. But also at that moment that it had happened, I remember saying, okay, Lord, the door is yours. I really do want to be safe, but you are a God who protects. I'm not gonna nag my husband anymore about the door, I put it in his hands. A week later, I came home and Mark and this other guy, um, Craig Masters, were fixing that door. And I remember looking at it, going into my room and crying, that's the way women let emotions go. I was so grateful. I realized that my environment changed without me focusing on it as I came and gave that thing to the Lord. And it was a lesson for the future. Rather than control it and have my way, bring things to the Most High God. Listen to Him. So it was a, a tremendous thing. So number two ways God reveals Himself. So one way is through the Scripture. You build a reservoir. And at the right time, he pulls the words up and says, what are you going to do with the words that I've given you? If you have no reservoir, that's going to be a problem for you. Number two, prophetic words. So we have a time after every service where on Sunday mornings where we take the last 15 minutes to let God speak. A lot of people leave during that. They get up and they leave. I mean, sometimes people just have to use the restroom and they come back. But a lot of people are done. They're ready, I'm going home, I heard, I'm done. We always kind of wonder at that because what happens up in front at that point is really rather amazing. So people, we pray, the ministry team, we ask for words. So number two, prophetic words. Someone hears the Lord speak and they proclaim it from their mouth. God gives directions. Um, it says in Corinthians that he gives the manifestation of his spirit for the common good as he wills. Now you can pray and ask all you want. I want to have miracles. I want to do miracles. Uh, and you might never get a miracle because God's given you a different gift. There's words of wisdom and knowledge and faith and miracles and healing and prophecy and gifts of tongues. All these things given by God as he wills. 
I've often prayed for gifts I never got because God gave me something different. So one, one day, uh, at the very beginning of service, we were all singing that song, It Is Well With My Soul, and there was this very tall African-American man in front of me, and I recognized he just stood out because he was so tall, and I hadn't seen him before on my area of church. You know, we all have our own areas where we sit, you know. So this, and I was looking at him, we were singing this song, and I hear again, tell that man, I will make it well with his soul. And I'm thinking, what? First of all, women pray for women. Men pray for men. That's a safeguard that there won't be any pickups or weird things going on. You know, anyone can walk forward even though they're not authorized. So we do things to protect. I'm thinking, did I really hear him? Because sometimes we don't want to, we want to be careful. We, we don't want to mild impressions to say, God told me. I mean, you know the people that say it all the time. God told me, God told me. Maybe they're right. I don't think that's a really great way um, to speak because maybe God didn't tell you. Maybe you're just an encourager. Women are encouragers. We just really want everything to go well, and we can go and say, the Lord wants me to tell you. I can't tell you how many times people have died after, in our congregation, after someone has said, this is not unto death. Now, I know they're being encouraging, and I know they're being, wanting to walk in faith, but we have to be careful. So I'm always checking myself now, is that from God? How do I know? And you know, God loved that man enough that even if I didn't say anything to him, God wasn't gonna let him go home without a word because either I would be um, just thinking I had a word all the time or maybe I was fearful, didn't know how to give it. God knows all these things. He wasn't gonna let that man not receive what he wanted. But as I was debating all this in my mind, um, I kind of talked myself out of it. What's the beginning of service? You don't pray for people at the beginning of service, you pray at the end. He should have a man pray for him, and how do I know for sure? So I talked myself out of it. The end of service, everyone, he's, you know, they had an altar call, come forward for prayer. And so I walked forward to pray for somebody when the man walks out of the aisle and bumps into me. I'm thinking, okay, I'm gonna take that as a sign. I, I said to him, are you going forward for prayer? And he said, yes. I said, well, I believe God wants me to tell you something. And he looks at me and I and, uh, said, would it be okay to pray for you? And he said, yes. So we moved to the side and I simply told him what had happened and that God said, I can make it well with your soul. And tears just welled up in this man's eyes and he said nothing. And then the other thing we learned through giving words is don't give more than you were given. Don't give more than you're given. If God only gave you this, trust him in it. That's why I didn't have anything else to say, right? So I thought, now I'm just going to pray a blessing. And then I started to think, gosh, if a man was praying for him, a man might be able to ask him questions and pray specific. So I'm telling you that because we war with ourselves. Did I say it right? Did I get it right? Should I have done it? That's just all a part of being human. So I gently set my hand on the man and I just prayed for a blessing. I don't know what his problems are. I don't know what he's going through, Lord, but you do. And you can make it well. Tears just ran down the man's eyes. When we were all done, he said, thank you, and went back into the aisle. And after all that second guessing, the following Sunday, the people he came with said, he went home undone that God would care about him and speak to someone else on his behalf. So it was a tremendous time of learning just to hear. God wants to give words, he wants to speak. He's out there waiting to speak to you. And we just really want to encourage you, God's up to something. And he really does want to include you guys in it. But someone has to be listening, believing that the kingdom of God is operating and receiving it and being a student of his word and learning his character. So the third point in hearing God is personal revelation. Sometimes God just wants to communicate in a spirit-to-spirit -spirit exchange. So he's not trying so much to give information simply as to bypass our minds and just go straight to our spirit. Like you can be worshiping and all of a sudden you're just filled you're just absolutely filled with the presence of God. 
So we just receive a reality more than a word. And, and one specific thing in my life was um, I had been reading the scriptures, and I was really good with uh, morning devotions. I had that down. I was great. But I was reading the scripture one day, and it said in Jeremiah, I was trying to memorize, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you will meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do all that is in it according to his word so that you might be prosperous and have success. And all of a sudden, that word night just kind of jumped out. Like the Lord was saying, would you give me the night? And I thought, no. <laughs> no, I give you the day. The night's my time. I'm, I'm not good at night. I'm tired. I'm lazy. I don't want to concentrate. You can't have the night too. But I knew the answer was yes. Of course you can. So I told him, all right, <clears throat> here's how it'll work. I'm always telling God how it'll work. He's very patient. He's very gracious. I said, I'm going to read a chapter in the Bible and pray, and then I'm going to go read my lazy books. So one of the things I've learned in getting discipline is when God asks something, give him something. Give him something to work with, because once you give him something, he'll take more, and pretty soon you're doing exactly what he wanted. So I uh, <clears throat> said, I'm going to give you this chapter. So I was reading the chapter, and all of a sudden, within two minutes, the presence of God just filled my room. I was sitting in the bed, reluctantly giving God his time, and I just started to cry because of the reality, the presence of God right there. It was as if the Lord said, I know more about what you need than you know. I know more about rest and filling than you know. And I came to give, not to take. And I just cried and sat there in the presence of God. I didn't want to read my lazy books. He didn't tell me I can't read my lazy books. He just said, give to me first. Like he wanted to give more. And it was a real revelation to me at that point. His word was life. So we're going to just stop for a moment. And we're going to pray. <clears throat> Lord, is there a place in my life where you're trying to meet with me and I'm resisting you? where you want to bring your life, and I'm afraid. Lord, is there a place I need to be to hear your voice daily? Your word says that you formed me in my mother's womb, that you chose me, that your thoughts toward me are more than the sands of the sea and the stars of the sky. That's hard to believe, and yet you said it. <clears throat> so where do I need to be that you can speak to me your thoughts? If you want to build a reservoir, I want to be the kind of person you can do that to. And you know me, you know my weaknesses, you know when I'm lazy, you know that I am flesh. But you said you'd do this thing, so I'm saying to you, you can build a reservoir in me. Show me how to start. And I just rebuke you, enemy, that what I have to give isn't enough. Lord, I give you what I have. You, 
You said you would take my weakness and you would make me strong. You said even when I didn't want it, you would put in me the will and show me how to perform your good pleasure. So I ask you today, put in me the will. I want to want what you want. Forgive me for my hardness and my willfulness. Your word says you're good and that you're patient and that your loving kindness is renewed every day. So I receive it. Thank you that you're patient with me. And that you made a promise. He that has begun a good work in me will finish it. Thank you that you promise even when I resist you that if I keep coming back, you will finish what you started. I just receive your grace to be a man of God or a woman of God. Amen. Amen. Um, I'm going to give you like an eight-minute break right now, but I want to just say something. Mark DuPont had a vision, and, and one, of, one of our uh, young men drew a picture of it, that Jesus was out in the ocean, right outside here in the Pacific Ocean by San Diego. And he, he was standing way out, but he was so large, he was only waist deep. And he drew his hands back like this, and all the water receded like it does in a, in a, like a tsunami or something. All the water pulled back. And then he went like this with his hand, and the water flew out all the way up the mountains, all the way up the coast of California. And as the waters receded back to the ocean, everywhere that people had dug a reservoir, the water stayed. It filled the reservoir and the water stayed. And he knew that this was the time when we as churches and we as people must build a reservoir because the presence of God, like he always did, revival comes when he's ready, when we're ready. And the people with the reservoir, his, his presence was going to resist. Um, I'm sorry, his presence was going to reside and stay. And so part of the reasons we're doing these classes is to help you learn how to build a reservoir. So we're going to give you its... Um, 10 minutes till. I'm going to give you about a seven, eight minute break right now. And during this time, if you don't have anything to do, you don't need to run to the restroom, I just suggest you turn to a person next to you and, and just tell them something that the Lord has revealed or shown to you during the times of these classes or a commitment that you've decided to make, some new way of thinking and just share it with each other. But uh, let's say at about um, two minutes to 10, we'll get started back up again. I hope you guys have had some real revelation as time's going on. Um, so we're going to uh, talk about three questions I need to ask when I perceive that God's speaking to me. Number one, does what I've seen or sensed or heard uh, line up with the nature of God as taught and revealed in the scriptures? There are other Jesuses out there. <clears throat> And God said, even if an angel, even if an angel appears to you, um, that Satan can disguise himself as an angel of light. So we have to know the nature of God as taught in the scriptures that he laid down. If it doesn't line up, then we need to discern why. Why I think I have a word or something that's coming from, the God, from God if it doesn't line up. In fact, for me personally, <clears throat> you know, home group was always where we began to learn to walk in the spirit, to listen to God and to hear and to accurately give a word on his behalf. And so I remember in the early days at home group one night, the power of God was in the room. It was an amazing time. And... Uh, as the power of God was there, I got a sense that people needed to, to interact with God tonight. There were some things that needed to be taken care of tonight. And so I said a word. I said, 
The door's open tonight for God to, to break strongholds, but that door will close tomorrow. Because there was a sense of urgency, and I was trying to figure out, well, all of a sudden, all over the room, first there's a lot of silence, and then all over the room, people start speaking scripture that was uh, about God's mercy and his long suffering and his loving kindness and his patience that was kind of in opposition to my word. And I'm listening to their word and I'm thinking, that's really true. Like, I said the wrong thing. And I felt really embarrassed and so I kind of sneaked out in the dark and went home. <laughs> how, to, how to take care of a situation, right? I just go home and never go back to home group ever again. <clears throat> So, felt really bad. Mark came home later that night, and I didn't want to talk to Mark. I didn't, I just thought, why would God give me a strong sense? I wasn't there before. Why did I have it? And, you know, what went wrong? So, Mark said, well, let's, um, let's just talk about, you know, what you felt. And so, as I was saying, I said, well, I felt like there was great power um, to receive grace for the situation that they were in. Like, God's presence was there, and they shouldn't grieve the Holy Spirit by not accessing that grace. And, and if they waited too long, their heart would start to harden. He said, that's great. Like what you just said right there, that lines up with the character of God. But that the door would close tomorrow didn't line up with the character of God. So thinking, I have to learn to know the word of God to be able to give a word accurately on his behalf. And so the people were great. They let me come back to the home fellowship. Nobody... <laughs> Nobody kicked me out, but that's where we learned. That's why we don't just open Sunday morning up to anyone who wants to come and give a word. Well, we don't know who's in our congregation or how well they hear. But if you ever sense something from God, you can always go to one of the, the staff pastors or Mark and Dave and, and just say, I'm sensing this. And they'll use their discernment whether, gosh, that might be something the whole church needs to hear or to wait. And this generally happens a lot on our worship nights where we're just really open saying, Who's, um, what is God doing here tonight? <clears throat> so we learn by doing. We wait if we're not sure. We ask someone wiser, is this right? Does this seem right to you? We apologize and fix things when we're wrong. And that's just a part of the whole learning process. We're learning together. You get a lot out of community. And that's why we really say, get into a home group. Get into a community of people will help you learn to hear the word of God. So does it line up with the nature of God? Is it in the scriptures? And number two, does it produce the fruit of the spirit? You think, well, I don't know. I don't know what the fruit of the spirit is. Well, that's a really good learning opportunity. <laughs> we need to know the fruit of the spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness. Is the word I have going to produce that? Or is it really judgmental and harsh? So if I'm on the ministry team and I'm up front and I sense something from the Lord that, like say my word, I perceive a weakness or something. Sometimes people perceive a weakness in someone else and they want to call it out. You know, um, but the scriptures say it's the kindness of God that leads to repentance. God's always been kind to me when I've been a jerk. When he comes and speaks to me, it's stern, but he's kind. I mean, he really wants to change. He doesn't want me to just feel bad. He says, I can change this thing. So if I perceive or know that someone's living in sexual sin and I call them out, you repent, you need to repent. Well, another way to give the word is there's an area controlling your life that the Lord wants to set you free from. Does that sound accurate to you? Is that something we can pray about? Oftentimes they would not. I said, do you want to share with it what it is? But I don't have to know. God knows. He, they're bringing it to him. That's the kindness of God leaning to, leading to repentance. So we want to know, is what I'm going to say on his behalf going to produce the fruit of the Spirit? And number three, <clears throat> does your revelation <clears throat> have the result of releasing you from the power of the circumstance over you? Truth sets people free. <clears throat> So let me give you an example. You know, it says we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but principalities and powers. Rulers of darkness. So people aren't my enemy. But people do bad things. And the truth is, I did bad things. I did things that were not good and kind and lovely, and, and we're all growing out of that as we, as we walk with the Lord. But 
teenagers are the worst. They are just selfish. They are self-centered. Like they should be old enough to help and do it, but they, they tend to be self-centered because foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child. So when one of my kids was a teenager, I have three boys, he was really hard for me, like he could push my buttons, and I know why, because Mark said it so well. He's just like you, honey. <laughs> so, well, he would do and say these things. Mark wasn't saying I was self-centered, but he was kind of in your face, just like I was. In fact, he and I were hotly debating a subject one time at the kitchen table, and poor Neil comes down and goes, stop yelling at each other. And I looked at my son, Bryce, and I said, I wasn't yelling at you. And he says, I wasn't yelling at you. And we both look at Neil, and he goes, you guys were yelling. So we were um, out, we were just loud and, and boisterous. Anyway, he would come into the, to the uh, room and tell what he wants and what he needs and all this stuff, and our, our tempers would get elevated, and and so fast, it would just be so fast. Like he'd come in the room and all of a sudden I was mad. And uh, one time this happened and all of a sudden I felt lifted kind of above it. Like all the anger was gone, I kind of lifted above it. And I heard this voice say, why do you let the spirit that comes on him come on you? And I realized in that instant that he wasn't, he wasn't possessed, he wasn't, uh, that he was just being influenced by a spirit. And when he came in with all of his words that the spirit is speaking to him, just, you know, here's what you should think, here's what you should do. And he's just agreeing and saying all these things. All of a sudden, it was in the room and I was operating out of that spirit. And I realized that I could operate out of a different spirit, but I had to discern it first. So why do you let the spirit that comes on him come on you? So I'm looking at this and I'm thinking, okay, I'm not angry now, I'm just trying to think, so what do I do? Now Mark was really good with the kids. When they'd come in angry or whatever, he would just slowly, gently, with temperance, talk them through things. I had to get them to leave <laughs> the room so our, we could all calm down and then we could talk rationally. So they'd go to their room and I would wait a while and and then when we could talk, we would talk. So I'm sitting there with this kid who's just going on and on, and I said, you need to stop talking and go to your room. He kept talking. So I said, okay, if you don't, after a number of these, I said, if you don't stop talking, you have one day restriction. Well, he kept going. I said, well, now if you don't stop and go to your room, you have two days. Well, I'm up to five. And he's just talking, I'm thinking, this is not working, Linda. This is not working, what are you gonna do? Go to 20? But I didn't know what else to do, so I said, you now have six. And he instantly stops, stares at me, and turns around and goes up the stairs to his room. And I'm thinking, thank God, because I didn't know what I was going to do. <clears throat> but I'm not angry. And for the first time ever, I've discerned that there was something else operating. And I didn't have to enter into the spirit that he did. I could live in the kingdom of God. So. Um, I waited for about 15 minutes, and I went into his room, and I said, I opened the door, and he looks at me and goes, Mom, why did I go to six? Like, why didn't I just go to three? <laughs> and I thought, why go to three? But he, what he was saying is that even he wondered at his lack of self-control. He thought, why couldn't I stop myself, right? now? When I talk about being influenced by a spirit, there's just spiritual influences all over. And it doesn't, it, um, it's not out of our control. He could have stopped. But he was wondering why he didn't. And so I learned to ask the question whenever I was in a situation, confrontation, in a room with other people, what is the spirit that's trying to influence here? Because that changed forever my interaction with my son. So this revelation that I think I have from God, I can look at now and I can say, does it have the result of releasing me from the power of the circumstance? And it changed. So it was the, I knew that this was the Lord speaking. Why do you let that spirit come on you? So oftentimes, after that, when I'd be in a classroom and an angry mom would come in, you know, just angry and just knows that her kid's right, you know, and I'd be staring at her thinking, my kid lies. Why do you think your kid doesn't lie? You know, I'm thinking in my mind, you know, but it changed rather than me entering into that anger. I could see differently because we wrestle not against flesh and blood. 
So recognizing the spirit that is influencing because the living of word of God is living and active, more powerful than any two-edged sword, pierces to the division of the soul and spirit, discerns the thoughts and the intents of the heart. So his word is living and active. It has power. It does things. It changes the environment around us. And you, we are bearers of a revelation. Jesus came to reveal the kingdom of God on earth, to, to teach us, to walk in it, um, and that wherever we went, we could bring the kingdom of God. So <clears throat> I want to ask a question. What, what language does God speak? He speaks reality. He speaks existence by his very word. He gave the stars and the plants and the animals and man, and, and he gives life to the dead. He calls into existence things that are not. He brings love. If he says, peace, be still, there's going to be peace, and you are going to be still. So his, the word of God contains peace and joy and life. You've got to know this. And he says the word of God is near you. It is in your mouth. It's in your heart. So the world was made by the word of God. <clears throat> it says all things have their being in him. That we understand that the world was prepared by the word of God. <clears throat> Sorry. So it says the things that we see that are visible are made up of things that we cannot see. So like, for example, this podium is made of metal, which is made of atoms, which are made of protons, neutrons, electrons, which are made of quarks. So if you break things down to the very smallest element, what are quarks made of? Well, just a bundle of vibrations that are held together by the word of God. The world is made, sound of God makes reality. So you know you hear E equals MC squared. Energy equals matter times the speed of light squared. So if I took this podium, and I, which is matter, and threw it at the speed of light times the speed of light squared, it becomes energy. This podium is just energy slowed down so that we can interact with it. So <clears throat> everything, God says, everything is made up of what I say. So the further we get from the word of God, then the further we get, more things start to fall apart. Thank you, I would appreciate that. So he's saying, come back and hear my voice and let me repair the things that have gone astray. Thank you so much. So we have this tremendous tool, the word of God that God gave to us. He said it's like a weapon. I had a picture one time as I went forward to pray at a women's conference, and the stage was like this, and all over the stage were um, weapons, guns and knives and swords, and they were just huge amount. It was a very quick, brief picture. They were everywhere, and all lined up, like in a semicircle this way, were a bunch of women. And one person went to the first woman, who was standing like this, and lifted a weapon, put it in her hand, and she stood up like this. And this person went to the next and the next, and they all did the same thing. They were all weary like this, lifted up the weapon, and they stood. Pretty soon they were all standing. She got to the very end and went to look back at what it, and the first person in line was like this again, had dropped their weapon, laid it down. So in the, in the vision, the picture, this process went three times through the whole group of women. And at the final time, she looked back, and again, they were like this. And she realized she could not make them hold their weapons. They had to hold it themselves. She could encourage. She could help them see where their weapons were, but they had to hold the weapons themselves. Couldn't do it for them. <clears throat> so the living word of God is a weapon to us. And I want to end with the power of a confession. So we know it says the word of God is near you, it's in your mouth, it's in your heart. It says if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth, you will be saved. So we know that there's importance in our confession, but it's more than just forgiveness of sin. 
because the Greek word to confess means to say the same things that God is saying. So to confess is to bring the power of the word of God and the life of God into a situation. Like we know the, the scripture, love your enemy, right? In the very beginning of your walk with God, you're real sketchy about that. Like, really? That's going to work? Like, how's that going to work? But as I walked with the Lord, there was a particular woman <clears throat> that was having a really hard time with everyone. And I just thought, if I could just love her really, really good and really, really hard, then um, <clears throat> everything would go well. So I gave it my very, very best. But her judgment toward everyone, and especially to me, was incredibly harsh. And after a really bad encounter, where she said a lot of really hard things, and I left, I was in my living room rehearsing all those words, rehearsing what she said and why she was wrong. And, and, and I had given my very best, and I, and I heard, love your enemy, love your enemy. Because she was spreading word all over about all kinds of Foothill staff and what was wrong with us. And, and I heard, love your enemy. So I was trying. I was walking. I was pacing like this. And all the words would come back to me. I rehearse them and say, no, no, no. You said love your enemy. So I choose love. And this is like a battle going on, a war. And then the words, but, you know, she was wrong when she said this because that's not right. And love your enemy. I choose love. And as I was doing this, all of a sudden, in the midst of that, I heard a crack, like, uh, uh, like I can only, like a femur bone breaking, a strong bone breaking in a different realm. It was like in a different realm. And when that crack happened, all of the angry energy of the room left in a heart. And again, I sat down thinking, what just happened? I wasn't mad at her. The anger was gone. The, I was sad. But I realized a, a war had just been battled in 20 minutes. And the choice, just the verbal choice, I choose love, had brought the kingdom of God and had broken the power of the enemy. I mean, it was, you, you know when a room is filled with something, you think, this is bad. And I sat there thinking, feeling the peace of God, that I could love her. I could choose love in the midst of a bad situation. And no longer was there the battle between choosing the two voices. I had made the choice. And that when I believed and acted and spoke, that his presence would come and take care of these situations. I wasn't on my own. Well, our confession should be what he said, not what I feel. I mean, I feel the reality of the thing. Her assessment of me did not define me. Maybe she was right on some issues. Maybe I really was immature. Maybe um, that I lacked wisdom. Maybe I really honestly needed more of the character of God. But he would give it. If I was those things, I could change. He could change me. She seemed unfair in her judgment, but again, he that begins a good work will complete it. So it didn't matter what she thought of me. God was good. He was for me. He would change me no matter what she decided, which makes me then able to forgive my enemy and then be at peace. So we're going to take one more minute to forgive someone. <clears throat> Let's pray. Lord, you, your word that you said was living and active and powerful said you promised you would complete what you started in me. Even if I fought against you, you would finish. So Lord, I want to get back on track. I want to step back into your will and ask you to complete what you started. Where I pressed pause, I want to unpress it. I want to take my finger off the pause button and push play.
I feel right now like the Lord saying, some of you have been angry at me <clears throat> because you did not understand. And the Lord's saying, will you give me that anger and trust that I see more than you see? And all you have to say is, here it is. I don't understand. But I confess that you are good. Lord, is there someone I need to forgive for a judgment they made against me? I give you their judgment. I forgive them for their words. And I confess that you can make something good of me. I believe that my reputation is in your hands, not theirs. And Lord, I just ask, what character are you trying to build in my life right now in my circumstances. I choose today to partner with you, Lord, not against you. So I take my fist down that I've shook at you and ask you to be a father to me and a shepherd. Amen. Amen. So I'm just going to finish with one story. <clears throat> the parable of the stereo. God always spoke in spirit. Jesus spoke in parables, so we'll call this the parable of the stereo. Stereo. So if stereo works on electricity, you got to plug it in, or it's not going to work, right? But even if you plug it in, like a stereo doesn't have power in itself. Its power comes. You plug it in. But when it's plugged in, it's got two wires. It's not going to. It's not going to plug it in, but if you don't, it's got a positive and a negative, it power in and power out. If you snip the power out, then the stereo isn't going to work. It's not going to work if it doesn't have the ability to exit. So like a stereo, God wants to come into you. He comes in, you reconnect to the power source. He comes in, he fills you, and then he wants you to send it back to him. So we kind of, God's completing a circuit. He comes into us, he fills us, and then he goes out. For example, God says, I, I forgive you all that you've done. He says, unless you will not forgive your neighbor. He says, if you will not, I will come in and fill you, and then you, in turn, forgive your neighbor. If you're not forgiving your neighbor, you're stuck. You're stuck right there because he wants to move through you. So the point of the confession is a completion of a circuit. The kingdom comes into me and inhabits me, and then I am so filled, I'm overflowing, and I go out in his name. So I just want to bless you guys to say hearing is one level of learning, but doing is another. So that's why we, we give you your homework. 
to sit in the presence of God, to ask him, what are you doing? What do you want to say to me? And what do you want to, when you're filled up, until you're filled up, God isn't expecting a lot. He needs to fill you so that you overflow. And so that's one of your prayers for this week. Fill me. And then if, if you're never filled, why don't you just ask the Lord, why do I never feel filled? Just ask and see what he says to you. But as you're getting this reservoir, you begin to flow out to others where it becomes easier and easier and easier to forgive your neighbor, to love your enemy, to do good to those who don't do good around you. So we have talked about hearing God, and I encourage you guys, you know, you're going to leave this place. Six days the Lord gives to the sons of men to do whatever you want. The seventh belongs to him. How are you going to seek the Lord today? There's a church service going on. There's a front altar to make commitments and confessions to the Lord. I really encourage you guys to do that. And next week, we only have two weeks left, Fawn will talk about um, life in the kingdom and what part is God's part and what part is your part. Makes it real clear. It's excellent. And finally, Jim Dealing will come and talk about breaking a stronghold that's identified in your life. So I'm just going to pray a blessing. Lord, fill these people. Let them go out with your word. Let it fill their hearts. We give you this day because it belongs to you. Amen. God bless you guys. Oh, you know what? Can we just finish with a song? Is that okay with you guys? All right, let's do um, I'm No Longer a Slave to Fear.